In this video, we're going to look at segment relationships in circles. And so we're going to start with a couple of theorems. Uh, theorem 1 is about a tangent to a circle. And so a, tang a line is tangent to a circle if and only if the line is perpendicular to the radius drawn to the point of tangency. Now let me kind of unpack that a little bit. If you remember back to when we defined a tangent line, a tangent line is a line that intersects a circle in only one point. So you can see here line AB is our tangent line that I've highlighted in red. It intersects circle O at point P. Point P is what we call the, the, the point of tangency. Okay, And so what this theorem is saying is that if I take another segment, like this um, radius right here, not any other segment, but if I take a radius, like radius OP, the radius to that same point of tangency, what's going to happen is it's going to be perpendicular right here. That's what we know. So if you have a diagram like this that has a tangent line and a radius drawn to that same point, you know that the radius must be perpendicular to that tangent line. That's what this theorem 1 says. Now on this slide, I've got two theorems that are really just converses of each other. Um, and so it, if we look right here, theorem 2 says if a line is drawn from the center of a circle, um, and I'm going to kind of highlight it so you can see what I'm talking about. So this center is sort of the diameter radius, so we're using a radius in this little diagram. And if it's perpendicular to the chord, then it bisects the chord. Meaning if this radius is perpendicular to this chord, then this point right here must be the midpoint of the chord. Now I'm going to do kind of a lazy proof on this. Um, and so what I want us to do is, is I'll be really quick, but uh, just pretend we don't know that that's congruent to that and this is all we have. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a couple of radii. We know that all radii are congruent. We know this segment's congruent to itself. And we know that's a right angle, so we know that must be a right angle. But what you're hopefully saying, if you remember back to congruent triangles, that I have two congruent triangles drawn here. I have a right triangle and another right triangle that are congruent by hypotenuse leg. So this triangle is congruent to this triangle by hypotenuse leg. That means every part in this triangle is congruent to every part in this triangle. Therefore, that's what we call CPCTC. That means, therefore, this segment must be congruent to this segment. Or in other words, this is the midpoint. So that was a quick kind of lazy proof, but the idea is this. If you have a diagram like this with a line that's perpendicular to the chord, you know that chord gets bisected. Now, theorem 3 is the same thing, just the converse of it. It's going to go in the other direction. So now what we're doing is we're pretending like we don't know this is a right angle. So it says, if a line drawn from the center of the circle, and once again, um, it says a diameter or a radius, but in our little picture here, it is a, it's, it's kind of like a radius. It, it kind of stops short, but um, to a midpoint on a chord, then the line is perpendicular to the chord. So once again, let's, let's kind of do the same quick proof, but pretend like we don't know this is a right angle. Okay. Once again, if I draw a radius and a radius, well, we know that all radii are congruent. So that's congruent to that. This segment's congruent to itself, and we were given that this segment's congruent to this segment. Therefore, this triangle is congruent to this triangle by side, side, side. And therefore, every part of this triangle is congruent to every part of this triangle by what we call CPCTC. Therefore, this angle must be congruent to this angle. And if I have two congruent angles that add up to 180 degrees like these do, that means that these both must be right angles. So once again, kind of a quick and lazy proof, but the idea is this, that if we have this same diagram, okay, and we have that this segment is congruent to this segment, then we know that this must be perpendicular to it. So once again, no, no these relationships, but once again, they're pretty much the same relationship, just the converse of each other. Next, theorem four, congruent chords are equidistant. Uh, so to kind of unpack this idea, or I, or I guess I'll read it first, but it says in a circle, two, chords are, two congruent chords are equidistant from the center of the circle. In other words, this chord WX, if it's congruent to YZ, that means that this length, this length CM, must be the same as this length CL, okay? And the, we're not going to prove it right now. It's not too bad of a proof, but we're not going to prove it right now. But think, think of it logically. If I have a, a chord that's way over here on the very edge of the circle, see how it's a little short chord? But as our chords get closer to the center of the circle, do you see how they get longer and longer and longer? And so just by using our intuition, it makes sense that if we have two chords that are the same length, like this one and this one, 
it makes sense that they're the same distance away from the center of the circle. Now, let's do a little check for understanding. It says a chord of a circle is 16 inches long, and its midpoint is 6 inches from the center of the circle. Calculate the length of the diameter of the circle. So I like this question because it ties in a few of those ideas we just talked about. And so the first thing I'd coach you up on is we always want to draw a picture, okay? So it's describing it in words, so let's try to visualize this. So I got that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw what is being described. It says a chord is 16 inches long. So I can draw a little chord, and I'm going to label that as 16 inches. And then it says that it's 6 inches from the center of the circle. So if I were to draw another little segment from the center down, it says that is 6 inches. It wants to know the length of the diameter. Well, you might be thinking, okay, well, that's interesting. I don't really know how I'd find the diameter. And so sometimes on this type of problem, we have to get creative about where we draw our radii and our, radii and our diameter. And so what we would see is this. It tells us that the midpoint is six inches from the center of the circle. So this is the midpoint. So that means if the whole chord is 16, that means that segment's eight and that segment's eight. And if you remember back to theorem three, it said if this segment comes from the center of the circle to the midpoint, that it must be perpendicular, okay? The reason that helps us is now if I draw a radii, We've got ourselves a little right triangle, and we can use our Pythagorean theorem. If you remember Pythagorean theorem that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, we know that 6 squared plus 8 squared would give us our radius. So 6 squared plus 8 squared would give us our radius squared. And if I just do a little math, I can combine those like terms, and we know that 100 is r squared, or in other words, that your radius is going to be 10 inches. Well, if your radius is 10 inches, we did all that work to find the radius, hopefully you're saying, oh, well, now I know what the diameter is. The diameter is just going to be twice the radius, which in this case would be 20 inches. So that was a tough problem. I think it was a little complicated, but it involved several of the theorems we just discussed. So um, I guess if there's one thing I'd coach you up on on this question, it would be draw your picture, and then sometimes you've got to be a little creative about where you draw your radii. Next this is the last theorem that we're going to cover in this video. This is theorem five, the chord-chord relationship. It says if two chords of a circle intersect, then the product of the lengths of the segments of one chord equals the products of the lengths of the segments of the other chord. Now, don't let the wording of that confuse you. I think it makes a little more sense to think of it as this. A times B equals C times D. Our proof for this one is not going to, or we're not going to include the proof for this one. Um, it's it's going to take a little bit too much time and not really the focus of this video. But just know that A times B is equal to C times D. Part times part equals part times part. Okay? And here's a little check for understanding. It says find A. So if you want to pause the video and try this one on your own, I think that would be a great idea. But what we know in this case is... Uh, a times B equals C times D, or part times part equals part times part. Well, in this case, that would be A times 8 equals 6 times 9. In other words, if I simplified 8A equals 54, and then if I divided by 8 on each side of my equation, I would have that A equals... And that 54 divided by 8 is 6.75, so that would be our A value. The end.